Hi there, everybody. It's Meredith from Mad Eye Moody Productions, and I'm super excited to be starting my video blog. This is my very first entry, so please bear with me as I work out all the kinks. I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about my top three tips for a good back to school first week, first day, um, the first couple of days for the new school year. These are especially helpful if you're maybe a new teacher or a teacher that's had maybe one or two years of experience, but that didn't go well. Um, also, any veteran teachers, there may be some tips here that you've never thought to try before or have thought about, but maybe just needed to hear it one more time before implementing it in your classroom. So let's get started. The most important tip that I have, the number one tip, is that you need to have in your mind and on paper established what rules and procedures you want in your classroom. And this goes beyond simply the be respectful. Um, it goes beyond the basic three or five rules you have for your classroom. Like students know that they're supposed to be respectful in your room. They understand that. What they don't know about you yet when they come into your room is what they're supposed to do when they need to sharpen their pencil. Uh, what are they supposed to do if the person next to them is bothering them and talking while they're supposed to be working? What are they supposed to do if they have to go to the bathroom? So things like that, procedures that we know what we want, but we sometimes forget that students don't know what we want. Uh, those are the kinds of things that you need to have spelled out on paper for students and go over it with them. You can do this all in one day, but I don't recommend that. I recommend taking a few days to go over it so that it's not so lumped into one and overwhelming for them. Um, think about things too, like how you want them to move around your classroom. When they need to get out of their seat, do you want them to raise their hand? That's going to depend on a level that you teach. You know, in elementary school, you probably want them raising their hand. Middle school, it's kind of up in the air, depending on the teacher and their comfort level. Um, in high school, uh, you may not want them raising their hand. You may tell them, you can get out of your seat and do what you need to do as long as you're moving around the room purposefully and going back to your seat as soon as you're done. Don't make a disruption. Don't be disruptive. So you really need to think about these things because you can't just expect students to know what you want or how you want them to do things. Um, so really take some time before the beginning of the year and sit down. And what I do is I call it a student contract. And I tell the students and I put it in the contract that this is how we're going to have the best year, that you know what to expect from me and I know what to expect from you. So um, then I put together those expectations and procedures and I run through them with the students and the students get to ask questions if they have them. Every once in a while, I'll leave something out, but I really try hard to make it comprehensive. You know, what if I have to go to the bathroom? What if I feel sick? What if I need to go to the nurse? What if I forgot my homework? What if I forgot a pencil? Uh, what if I left something in my locker? Pretty much every question you can think of that a student's gonna ask you about moving around the classroom or potentially disrupting the lesson, that's the kind of thing you want to cover at the beginning of the year and remind them at, throughout the year as those things happen. You know what? Um, you may not remember this, but at the beginning of the year, we talked about what to do if you need to blow your nose. And this is what I expect from you. And so setting that up at the beginning of the year is super important for the rest of your year to run smoothly. And you want to have it written out in, in, in paper, on paper for students to go through with you so that they don't have to try and remember it. I have them keep it in their binder the entire year and refer back to it if I see something that's becoming a chronic problem. So that's my number one tip for a good back to school um, time that will then translate into a really good year for you. The second thing I have is to assign seats. It's pretty typical in elementary school to assign seats, but a lot of people think that when you move into secondary education, students get to just pick their seats. And veteran teachers, a lot of times, will know that that's not always the right thing to do. Uh, but even some veteran teachers think that not assigning seats allows the students some, some form of choice, some form of um, autonomy. But it's really better for everyone if you assign seats, especially at the beginning of the year. Uh, I know a lot of teachers who start off with their seats assigned and then move to pick your seat Friday so that the students do get some of that autonomy back, but it's not consistent. But having assigned seats that first day is really going to help facilitate your ability to do things like take attendance, get to know the students. Having assigned seats for at least a, a couple of weeks until you get to know the students' names can be extraordinarily helpful, especially if you have a program that has pictures of the students. You can put those pictures in the 
format that you want their seats to be in, and then you can really use that to help you learn those students' names. It'll also give students a feeling of security so that they know where they're supposed to go, where they're supposed to be, and it doesn't give them any anxiety of, well, what if somebody doesn't want to sit next to me? What if somebody tells me I can't sit next to them? What do I do if there's no seats left? What do I, you know, do I have to tell the teacher that I, I have to sit on the floor? It alleviates a lot of that anxiety for students if they know that they have a seat and that's the seat they're supposed to sit in. So that's my second tip. My third tip is to have non-curricular tasks set up for the first couple of days so that you have something to do with your students that isn't just, hey, let's go over the rules. Most schools have procedures for the first couple of days where you're supposed to go over the student handbook, the dress code, uh, school rules and policies and procedures, and then of course you have your own classroom policies and procedures that you're gonna be going over with students. And after a day or two of those, students really start to glaze over and they can't take much more of it. And so what you wanna make sure that you're doing is you're breaking up that monotony and giving them something to do that's beneficial for them and not necessarily something that's gonna take a lot of prep time on your part or a lot of work on your part, but it's gonna be good for them to stay, help stay focused after you've maybe done a 10 minute conversation about the district dress code and then you do a non-curricular task and then you wrap it up by maybe talking about um, the school tardy policy. So what that means when I say a non-curricular task is something that isn't related to a standard or a lesson that you have designed for a day. Now it can be, uh, it, it could relate in some way, but you didn't pick it because it relates to an objective that you're trying to achieve. So for example, a logic puzzle. A logic puzzle can be a really good non-curricular task. It doesn't tie in into any standards unless you wanna really stretch it and say that it may have something to do with some sort of reasoning and analyzing. Um, but the nice thing about non-curricular tasks is you don't have to struggle with that because it's the beginning of the year and no one's expecting you to do something um, that's curricular on that very first day of school or the very second day of school, unless you're like my district, in which case uh, some of the classes you are expected to work on the second day of school. But everybody has the autonomy in their classroom to give a little bit of leeway to that. I actually have five days set aside to do non-curricular tasks with my students. Brain teasers are a really, really good non-curricular task that has a low floor, um, for the, so the ability for everybody to start the task and then struggle with it and um, hopefully get to the end. But another thing about non-curricular tasks is it's okay if students don't get to the end. It's okay if they don't get to the right answer and because it teaches them that struggle is productive and that they are in a safe place, that you're, you're helping build that classroom community of you know, I don't know this, I don't, I don't know how to get to the right answer, but I'm working hard and that's what's important. Another thing that non-curricular tasks can do is help you facilitate the setup of classroom norms. So if you are somebody who is a big group work person, your students are gonna be working in groups a lot, then you wanna have some sort of activity that lets them work in groups so that they can come together with you and come up with group work norms. So you give them an activity, this non-curricular task, and they do this activity in a group and you are watching them while they're working on this non-curricular task and filing away the behaviors you're seeing that are not productive to that task and are not productive to group work in general. Then when you're done, you get everybody back and you debrief and you consolidate and say, hey, you know, I noticed some things that seemed like it was making things very difficult for groups to work or for groups to be productive. Let's talk about what good group work looks like. What does good group work look like? And then you can have your, your sticky chart paper or on a whiteboard or whatever, however you wanna document it. And you can let those students come up with those norms. And I guarantee you, they're gonna come up with the norms that you want them to. And if they don't, you can always shuttle them in the right direction. Um, what I always used to do is I would do it with every class and then I would come up with the ones I would have my own that I wanted them to have. And I would just tell them that it, a, another class came up with it and I really liked that one. <laughs> and they have no idea what went on in my other classes. So that was a really good way to say, no, it came from the students. It just came from a different class. It wasn't yours. I used, I used this one from your class because you know someone in that class said everybody gets a turn or something that's you know productive for group work. You wanna make sure too that you have what something good looks like and what something not good looks like. So if they have, oh, everyone should 
uh, take turns sharing. Okay, that's what everyone should be doing. What shouldn't people be doing? Oh, well, people shouldn't be sitting there doing nothing. Oh, people shouldn't hog the conversation. Oh, pe so you want to get them thinking about what something looks like and what something doesn't look like to really solidify in their heads what those norms are going to be. So non-curricular tasks are really good for doing that because even if you're doing it individually, you can then have a collective talk about what are some of those norms for working independently. Were there people who were talking, making it difficult for others to concentrate? Were there people who were off task? You know, what does good independent work look like? What should we be seeing if somebody walks into the room and we're doing independent work? What should that look like? And how should we be showing our behavior and our task and our learning during that time? And that's something that non-curricular tasks are really good at because they aren't curricular. They're not based on an objective and a specific outcome. And so it really gives students the freedom to work on those behaviors and will give you really good information about how well those students work together already versus sometimes you might need to do a little bit more work and maybe have an extra day or two of non-curricular tasks to get some of that practice in um, once you've set up those norms. So those are my top three tips for starting the school year. Uh, remember the first one was having procedures and rules and expectations set up beforehand and on paper so you can go over them with your class thinking about everything that students could possibly ask and need to know about how your class runs. The second was assigning seats, and the third was non-curricular tasks to facilitate norms. Now, if you liked this video and you wanna see more content like this, make sure you click that like button at the bottom of the screen and subscribe to my channel, and you'll see more of this come on really soon. Thanks so much. Have a great day, you guys. Bye-bye.